Recording in
Who do you hear? So let's make sure. Can you hear us or hear me? Great. Can I hear you? Could I just, could somebody say something? Do you hear me? Okay, now I can hear you. A little you. bit of lag, but I can hear you. Wonderful. <clears throat> okay. Well, I apologize. I've never had so much difficulty entering a Zoom room before, but we got it solved. So thank you for your patience, everyone. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon to those joining us virtually on Zoom, uh, if, whether it is your morning, afternoon, or evening. For those who may no, don't know me, my name is Zahra Hosseinpour, a legal counsel at Tehran Regional Arbitration Center and the track Vispi Mood Program Administrator. Uh, and this is our fifth Vispi Mood uh, opening webinar. Uh, featuring a panel discussion on issues raised uh, on this year's problem of this moot court, um, as well as the oral advocacy skills. Before the discussion begins, I would like to invite Dr. Obeis Rezvanian, Director of Tehran Regional Arbitration Center, track, to deliver the welcoming remarks, giving an overview of the track this Moot program through the years. Dear doctor, please take the floor. Thank you. So the two manish that I wish you all the best because I wish you should be strong. Like this. Very good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to track fifth with pre mood competition. I remember in 2014, the very first ever Iranian team was participating in the WIS competition. They were all very brilliant members of the team. But the problem was that at that time, nobody in Iran knew what WIS and the competition is all about, and nobody was aware of that. So they were just looking for a place to have their meetings and can deliberate with each other. So they wrote to track and we welcomed them. They came there, they arranged everything there and eventually they shone in the competition. But what I thought at that occasion with myself was that maybe we really need some educational and promotional activities for introducing arbitration to Iranian students, Iranian scholars, maybe the practitioners or the professors even in the universities. Not the same as what they are learning or teaching in the universities and the schools, but in line with that in a more practical way. That triggered the idea in our mind. So what happened, we created a basket of activities educational and promotional activities in track since 2015. The, well, okay, do, do you hear me well? Harold, I see that you, okay, perfect. Thank you. That, that was the trigger point. So we started, first of all, we started an Iranian moot court in Iran. It's now seven years old. We are very proud of that. This is actually the most known and very reputable moot in a domestic level in Iran. We had also the dissertation prize, which is also very known among the students. And many students love that because it's a cash prize. And also we have the V pre moot since 2016, and this is the fifth one. Believe it or not, in the first year of track V pre moot, we had two teams, two Iranian teams only, and we had some difficulties to find the arbitrators to sit in a moot that was just initiated. So, but now in this year, in the fifth year of track V pre moot, I am really excited and honored to announce that more than 40 teams from uh, up to 20, from up to 20 countries participated and registered for the, the competition. My colleagues in the, in the committee reviewed the applications. And eventually right now we have 20 teams from 18 countries 
This is really amazing. Participants from China, USA, Uzbekistan, Russia, Poland, India, Iran, Slovenia, Ukraine, Finland, Netherlands, the Switzerland, Malaysia, Italy, Indonesia, Guatemala, Germany, and Turkey. So this is really heartwarming for us. We have also the honor of the honor of having many well-known arbitrators from around the world who were willing and very kind enough to participate in track the pre-moot pre competition. And we believe that tracks with pre -moot is becoming more and more known in the region. So this is it. I welcome all teams to track these pre -moots. And I wish them a very exciting journey in the next two days, not only in the next two days, but in the next coming weeks in other pre moves that they will be participating and also in the real competition itself. And I believe that they will learn a lot from these competitions and I advise them to concentrate on the experiences rather than being the winner or loser or rather than the scores because what really matters here is the experience of being a part of a competition like this. Also, I should say that my colleagues in track are here in this room and the next rooms working on every detail and monitoring every session. They are always available and online should you have any problem or question during the next two days, just write to them and contact them. They are always available to help you and hope there would be no problem in that. The last but not the least, I should sincerely thank our distinguished speakers, uh, Professor Damesis. Professor Damesis, I think everybody in Iran know you as a great mentor and supporter of Iranian participants in the V since Always, I guess. I guess from the first team that I just referred to in 2014, you were the supporter and, and very good mentor of the Iranian team. Thank you very much. And also Dr. Sipol, uh, who, has a, who has a very great experience in international arbitration. And I'm pretty much sure that he has so much to teach the students about the oral advocacy skills. And I believe the students and the participants will learn a lot from our distinguished speakers. I leave it now to Zahra and wish you all the best in your journey. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rezwanian. Uh, without further ado, I will introduce you to our distinguished panel. Our keynote speaker, Professor Antony Demsis, has uh, over 20 years of experience in arbitration, sales law, and contracts law. He is a fellow of the Chartered uh, in Institutes of Arbitrators. He has been uh, teaching at the University of Ottawa since 2003 and is the director of Bidural National Program. He is also the director of the faculties mooting program. He teaches contracts law, international sales law, international commercial arbitration, and also he coaches the faculties JSOP, WIS, and FDI moot court, with moot, moot court teams. He helps many students with moot court competitions. Professor Dempsey is also director of education for the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, Canadian branch, he is also an associate door tenant at Littleton Chambers in London and a member of its international arbitrator group. For 30 minutes, Professor Dempsey will, will talk on how to reach the law of the arbitration agreements, explaining the correct understanding of separability and the extent that the CISG governs arbitration agreements. We also have Dr. Harald Sipel as our guest speaker here. Dr. Sipel is the co-founder of the Mooting Hub, an online platform for moot court competitions that provides on-demand lessons to students throughout the competitions. He has also authored the book, 
how to win, uh, Mooting to Win, sorry, the book Mooting to Win, which is about how to succeed in international moot court competitions. Since 2010, uh, Dr. Sibel has been giving lectures to well over a thousand moot court competition students and has been sitting as a judge in more than a hundred matches. He's uh, the founder and principal of uh, Sipa Legal, an international boutique firm. He primarily deals with the matters of international dispute resolution with a strong emphasis on dispute avoidance. And he's a good friend of mine. Okay. <laughs> He has also held executive letter level positions with the Asian International Arbitration Center, AIAC, and the Bali International Arbitration Center, BIAMC, where he oversaw the administration of thousands of ADR matters. Dr. Harad Sibel will extend the discussion for another 30 minutes. Uh, to the oral advocacy skills, addressing the top 10 mooting tips to help the mootees in their preparation for the competitions ahead. At the end of the webinar, we will have a Q&A for 10 minutes. Attendees can engage and contribute to the discussion and type their questions in the uh, Q&A section. Now I'd like to invite Professor Anthony Dempsey to begin the discussion. Professor Dempsey. The floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Osimpour. And uh, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Very yes. good. Great. And, and, and thank you, Dr. Rezvanian, for very kind remarks. Dr. Sippel, I'm very happy to share the virtual floor with you today. And uh, thank you to everybody in the audience. Now, Dr. Rezvanian, you had mentioned that original team. And of course, I remember them very well. In fact, I have stayed in touch with almost every member of that team. Now, my, I'm not sure why my camera keeps flipping off and on. So I apologize for that. I'll, I'll try to catch it each time. Fabulous team from Iran. You, are you, you're not hearing me? Yeah, okay, fine. And so, um, in fact, I even traveled to Iran. Maybe it was 2015 or 2016. I, I'm, I'm forgetting now the years go by. And of course, in this pandemic, they seem to just become a big blur. But I had a wonderful time in Tehran where we, we met more students, more lawyers from a lot to say, so I'd like to get on with it. Now, I'd like to, of course, thank the Tehran Regional Arbitration Center for kindly inviting me to share some of my thoughts on a couple of topics that I believe are quite relevant to the 29th moot. Now, I don't know if I'm going to give you absolute answers to the questions that the this moot raises, and that's for a couple of reasons. First, I don't know if I have all the answers. But more importantly, as advocates, you are the ones who have to come up with the answers. And there is not always one answer to some of these issues. Now, tomorrow I'll be talking also about validity in the context of general terms as they are attempted to enter contracts. But today's validity discussion is necessary to put any broad discussion of the validity of international commercial contracts into their, per, into their proper perspective, I would say. And this is especially so when we have arbitration agreements. In fact, I would go so far as to say that today's talk is far more nuanced and should offer you a perspective different than what you may have already gleaned from your own personal research. So what are these two topics that I'm going to discuss? 
So my camera has now frozen. Oh, it's like Zoom does not want me to appear. Can you at least still hear me? Okay, so maybe when this sorts itself out, we'll, uh, we'll keep going. So the two topics are separability and how the CISG interacts with arbitration agreements. Now, a word of warning. And here I apologize in advance if I'm offending any audience members. But in my respectful view, most people do not, <clears throat> do not understand separability. They think they do. They even write about it, which is a big shock to me when I read what they write, but they don't understand it. And so they don't know how to apply it. Thus, if you are relying on some of these writings, you too may have some difficulty applying it. My hope is that I may help in this regard, uh, especially if you have relied on some of these sources. Now, the second topic is connected to the first and why you should understand under why these two aspects of this year's moot problem are so critical. Once you have a clear position on separability, it becomes a lot easier to know how to understand applicable laws to contracts and especially terms within these contracts, whether or not they have been validly incorporated or not. Yes, so <clears throat> I'm, I, I just as a, the host keeps asking me to switch my camera on, I switch it on and then as you see, it just switches itself off. I'm not sure why. Fortunately, I am not so handsome, so you're not missing much and not seeing me. But I will try and hopefully the camera will come back on. Okay, let's get back to it. Now, as you all know, many of the advantages touted by arbitration enthusiasts is that it offers a faster, sometimes cheaper method to resolve disputes. But as many of you know, at least those who have actually been involved in arbitrations, this belief does not always translate into reality. Personally, I've been involved in arbitrations that have taken three, four, five times as long as they nor cheaper is because one party is exploiting what I would call another party's knowledge gap. Equally regretful is when all parties suffer from the same knowledge gap. And the trouble with knowledge gaps is that they cost money to fill, either because you have to learn on the job or through unnecessary motions, requests, and submissions from parties all of which cost time to produce, assess, and decide upon. After all, a lawyer is not allowed to ignore a request from the other side, no matter how absurd it is. And so costs escalate. So with my time today, I'm going to attempt to fill some of these knowledge gaps with a hope that you will allow um, or have the ability to swiftly combat these specious arguments that may be put to you by opposing parties in real life and also at the VIS. In other words, if you hear absurd arguments from the other side, we will help you, or at least I hope that these ideas will help you to quickly deal with them. So the first one, as I said from the outset, is separability. Watered down to a simple heuristic, which is an intellectual shortcut, leads to misunderstanding separability's true objective. A heuristic understanding of separability suggests the following, that an arbitration agreement is separate from the larger contract in which it is contained and therefore treated as a separate contract. Now, this is one of the first lessons taught to international arbitration initiates. The doctrine is often a jarring lesson to newcomers, but it quickly imprints itself 
onto the recruit's psyche to form an essential part of this new knowledge base that distinguishes those who understand arbitration from those who do not understand arbitration. In fact, I'm sure many of you have become initiated in arbitration through this doctrine of separability. Some Many inductees assume that each time you have an arbitration agreement contained in a contract, the doctrine applies. But this is not so. Now, I'll first explain the true separability doctrine and offer some historical context explaining why it exists. And then I'm going to provide you a framework that I believe should help you not to commit mistakes we see all the time. I have recently made these submissions to Canada's highest court. Why? Well, for the awfully simple reason that our Canadian courts were falling into the same trap that we see tribunals, authorities who write on the topic and courts around the world falling in into. The decision has not come out. I only made these arguments in January. So we'll have to see if Canada's highest court agrees with me or believes me to be a lunatic. I hope it is the first that they agree with me. But at its simplest, the separability doctrine, when it applies, and I'm going to return to that idea because separability does not always apply, posits that an arbitration clause included within a larger contract is treated as a separate contract. This means that when parties agree to the contract, Contract, which includes an arbitration clause, it is suggested that they have actually agreed to two contracts. The first is a larger container contract. The second is an arbitration contract. It's an important and stark consequence. Now, we know historically why the doctrine emerged. So I'll just quickly remind you of why it was seen as necessary in the context of arbitration, because contract, the main contract, is invalid. And if we prevail, then by necessity, any terms inside of that contract, including the arbitration clause, is invalid. Therefore, and you could almost imagine a lawyer doing it <clears throat> with a smile on their face, it's not that we don't like arbitration. It's simply that we believe we are correct, that the contract is invalid, and the tribunal would therefore have no jurisdiction if we're right. Now, this is a powerful argument. And so to counter this powerful argument, the theory of an arbitration agreement in particular instances being treated independently arose. Now, what are those particular circumstances? Well, it's when you are attacking the main contract and by that attack claiming the arbitration agreement inside that contract is also invalid. That is it. That is why the doctrine emerged, to protect the integrity of the tribunal. Now, along the way, we've lost sight of that. France in particular seems to have really lost its way on the original purposes of arbitration agreements but it was needed, and so it emerged. But how did it emerge? Well, in England, it emerged as the doctrine of separability. In the US, it emerged as a doctrine of severability. Many civil law jurisdictions, including France, discusses this very important but basic idea under the broad heading of autonomy. More specifically, the autonomy de la clause compromisoire. Now, that phrasing alone has caused a lot of confusion because it suggests that it is always independent. And I'm here to tell you 
that it may not always be independent. <clears throat> now, as you undoubtedly know, this year's moot problem has Danubia as its seat of arbitration. Danubia is a model law jurisdiction. And if there are any audience members who are not familiar with this problem, don't worry, there is no such place as Danubia. It is invented for the purposes of the moot. It is a, an old Latin term, but it, you know, I don't want you to search the atlas for some jurisdiction called Danubia. It is nevertheless a 2006 model law jurisdiction. Now that will become important because as you undoubtedly know, the model law has a rule of separability, which is housed in article 16 of the model law. But what rule of separability does 16 give us? Does it give us one that creates a completely independent arbitration clause from the main contract? Or is it something else? I would invite you to carefully read Article 16. And when you read it, you might discover that it is a rather limited approach to separability, one that is very closely aligned with the historical rise of this doctrine. If you read the second sentence, it begins with, for that purpose. Now, what is the model law signaling by that? Well, what it is signaling is, for the purpose of a tribunal who must rule on its own jurisdiction, a clause is deemed separate and independent. Now, it's very important to understand what the model law is telling us. It is not telling us that arbitration agreements and contracts are always separate or are always independent. What it is telling us is if you are these old time lawyers who are trying to attack the arbitration clause by attacking the main contract, well, guess what? You don't get to play that game. Instead, we will treat the arbitration agreement separately. But that's very different from saying a contract that has an arbitration agreement is two contracts. And here I'm going to pick on the former president of the International Court of Justice, Justice Stephen Schwabel, because in 1987, he wrote something, and I assure you, I know he knows, he knew the difference, the late Schwabel, he knew the difference, but back then he wrote a quote that is often repeated in the literature, and it's a very dramatic quote, so let me read it to you. When the parties to an arbitration agreement or to an agreement containing an arbitration clause, enter into that agreement, they conclude not one, but two agreements, the arbitral twin of which survives any birth defect or acquired disability of the principal agreement. Now, the dangerous part about quotes is the more dramatic you make them, the more often they will be repeated by people. The real problem with this quote is that it's wrong or at the very least, it can lead people to misunderstand arbitration and the separability doctrine, because it would seem to suggest that, in his own words, they conclude not one but two agreements. But that is patently false under the model law. The model law does not say, when you have a contract with an arbitration agreement, you have two contracts. All it says, as I just said a moment ago, is that when you attack the integrity of the tribunal's jurisdiction in the hope of evading your arbitration agreement, then the model law's rule of separability kicks in and says, now we'll treat them as separate. The Cognitive bias trap. It's known as attribution substitution. And I know how complicated that sounds. But briefly, what attribution substitution is, it sees an individual substituting a more complex understanding of separability 
in this case, its original purpose, for a simpler understanding of the doctrine. Here, Justice Schwabel's explanation. In other words, we see this very often in complicated areas of the law. It takes a lot of effort to remember the intricacies of a rule. It's far simpler to just have a shorthand. Now, shorthands can be useful to any lawyer. In fact, that's why often when we look at cases, people say, what is the ratio of the case? Just a one-liner to tell me what the case stands for. But as you probably know, if you try to learn law with one-liners, you end up learning nothing. You have to understand why that one line says what it says. And so we see this a lot in law, and unfortunately, it has crept into the separability doctrine. Now, more evidence that, that um, arbitration agreements are not actually independent contracts, and this becomes quite relevant to this year's problem, is the following. <clears throat> when you try to figure out what law uh, applies to an arbitration agreement, what procedure do you use? Well, let me put it this way. If an arbitration agreement is truly an independent contract, then shouldn't the answer be very simple? use the same approach you would use to find the applicable law to a contract. And here it would be rules of private international law or conflicts of law analyses. But we know that's not how it works with arbitration agreements. Instead, what we see the majority of courts and tribunals doing is using one of three approaches. Either it borrows the law of the principal contract, in other words, if you have a choice of law for the contract and the question arises, what law applies to the arbitration agreement? Many courts say, well, that's easy. The choice of law to the contract. Other approaches are using the New York Convention's conflict rule by analogy. And a third approach is what has been termed the validation principle. Now, I'll briefly deal with each of these, but Let's take a moment to pause and ask ourselves, why are we using these peculiar ways of figuring out what law applies to an arbitration agreement if an arbitration agreement is actually independent, its own standalone contract? It is troublesome. So very briefly, I've already explained borrowing the law from the principal contract, and this is more who have taken a pragmatic approach to the question where they say, listen, folks, we are dealing with business people who have entered a contract. Do you really think that when they entered this contract, they thought different laws would apply to different provisions in their contract? If they wanted to do that, they could have done that. And while it's probably not advisable to do it, it's not disallowed but they didn't do that. So most courts say, why are you wasting my time with these theories on how to reach an arbitration agreement? Just use the main contracts, uh, main contracts law. Well, that is maybe where the validation principle has become um, interesting for many jurists because they say, okay, but if the consequence of applying the, the main contracts law is that it invalidates the arbitration agreement, Aren't we undermining the party's decision to have nearly all of their disputes resolved by arbitration? And when you can convince a court or a tribunal of that, you can would validate their agreement. Now, Gary Bourne uh, is often referred to uh, when talking about the validation principle, but you should know that this principle has been around well before Gary Bourne spoke about it. Swiss law has often, for, for a very, very long time, known of this principle. My own country of Canada, one of our jurisdictions, the province of Quebec, has always had the validation principle as part of its law. 
In other words, this is not some new creation. It has been rather strongly seated in many jurisdictions. Finally, then, this analogy to 5.1a, and frankly, it should also be extended to the model law. What is that um, process letting us know? Well, in brief, Article 5.1a of the New York Convention gives us a rule that effectively says, and this is at the enforcement of awards, in order to enforce an award, Award, if an arbitration agreement that led to the award is invalid, it is a ground to refuse the recognition and enforcement of that award. And so 5.1a offers a rule to say, to assess the validity of an arbitration agreement, we look to what law it is governed by. And 5.1a says, more or less, it is governed by the law that the parties have subjected it to, failing an indication of that, then it is under the law of the country where the award was made, which is a long way of saying the seat. So Article 5.1a tells us, if you want to assess the validity of an arbitration agreement, look at what law the parties have subjected it to. And if you can't figure that out, well, then it's the law of the seat. And so parties, uh, courts, and tribunals have said, well, why don't we just use that law to answer the question of what law applies to an arbitration agreement if it comes up during a hearing. It should be consistent. <clears throat> so we now see that despite people speaking of arbitration agreements as somehow independent or separate from the main contract, this separateness and independence um, is getting more and more questionable. So what is the true nature of separability? Is it really two contracts, or is it merely a method to safeguard the arbitral tribunal's jurisdiction, as the model law would seem to suggest? Now, I do like giving clear answers, but unfortunately on this one, I cannot, because it could be neither, and it could be both. It could be that arbitration agreements are entirely independent, but it could also be that they are moderately separate for one purpose only. Why, could, why do I say that? Now, if, if my camera were working, and let's see if it works now, no, uh, you would see I'm saying it with a straight face that it's neither one nor the other. So let me offer you a framework so that you will never run into problems when it comes to separability and using the correct rule. And as I mentioned, this is a framework I I've written about, and it's one that I had just submitted to our highest court in Canada, which if they agree with me, might become the first court to ever pronounce this way on separability. So you will have heard it first before Canadians read that judgment, if it is uh, in line with what I had put to the court. To understand this framework though, we need to be very clear about how separability ever comes into play. Because as I hope I've made clear, the separability doctrine is very easy to misconstrue and probably easier to misapply. And in my view, these mis misunderstandings often result from overlooking the discrete ways in which separability comes to apply or not. And separability comes into play broadly in one of three ways. So here's the framework. The first way a rule of separability may come into play is what I would describe as a statutory rule of separability. When parties have not expressly excluded a rule of separability, but have also not selected or drafted their own arbitration rules to govern the arbitration, the rule of separability that applies is the one set down in the applicable arbitration statute. So for the 29th vis, Article 16 may seem rather relevant. The second way, however, that a rule of separability can come about is what I would call party choice. Parties may agree to a set of arbitration rules and where these rules incorporate a particular rule of separability it's that rule of separability that applies to the arbitration. Thus, 
you must decide whether it is the AIAC's rule of separability that applies or that of the model law. And the only way to answer that is to answer yet another question. Is the rule in the model law or the statutory rule mandatory? And if it's mandatory and different from the party selected rule, well, then you are starting to get to the answer that you need to give. The third way, and here, this is to my mind, the most tragic way, the one that has caused the most problems in writings and in thinking. The third way a rule of separability may come into play is what I refer to as a general rule of separability derived mostly from cases. Now, from time to time, when arbitration statutes do not refer to separability and the parties do not have a set of arbitration rules, the question is, does separability apply? If we look to old English cases like Heyman v. Darwin, Bremer Vulcan, and the Harbor Assurance v. Kansas case, we seem to believe that there is some general rule of separability that always applies, but be very careful. Ask yourself, why were those cases talking about separability as a general concept? And the answer is straightforward. It's be because before the Arbitration Act of 1996, England's Arbitration Act, there was no statutory rule of separability in English arbitration law. It only came about in 1996 when Section 7 of that act was put into force. And since 1996, and I would point you to the premium NAFTA case, it was noted that cases that came before 1996 are not very relevant once a rule in the act exists. So why am I telling you this? Because it troubles me when I read authorities, and I put authorities in quotations here on this point, who talk about separability referring to these old English cases. That rule of separability has no application in the face of statutory rules. Therefore, when you're talking about separability, I'll be very concrete about this, when you're in a model law jurisdiction, you should never talk about Heyman v. Darwin's, Bremer Volk, Harbor Assurance, you should never talk about those because they are not relevant. They do not reflect Article 16's rule of separability. And yet, you've, I know you've all done diligent research. I'm sure you have read authorities who keep mixing those cases in with discussions of Article 16, and it gets all very ugly. Now, I know I, I, I'm running low on time. Um, so I will, I will accelerate a little bit, but just a little flag, it gets even more complicated than what I suggested because even arbitration centers rules are different from one center to the other. You know, some rules say that you may deal with um, separability when the main contract's existence is called into play. Other rules are more limited, and they say the separability doctrine will only apply when the question of validity is called into question. Now, it's important to distinguish between existence of a contract and whether or not it is valid. A non-existent contract means there's nothing there. An invalid contract suggests something is there, but it, doesn't, it wasn't done properly. It's a subtle difference, but that difference exists and you must look to the rule and the limits that a particular rule places because that also shapes your argument. If a party is trying to use separability in the context of an existence question and yet the rule does not allow it, the other party should say, end of story. Tribunal, you don't have the jurisdiction to answer this question because the rule that governs your jurisdiction does not allow you to. This point is so often missed that it hurts. It hurts me when I read it. I think, oh, here we go again. So those are the three kind of framework approach that you should ask yourself. Is there a rule of, of separability that applies to me? And first you should look to a statute. 
then you ask yourself, is that statutory rule mandatory or not? If it is not, then you say, okay, is there a rule of separability that the parties have selected? And if the answer is yes, you use that rule. Now, and I'll finish this topic on this last point that is so often missed. Crucially, separability is not necessary to make arbitration work, which means if there is no statutory rule and there is no party chosen rule, there is actually no reason to separate contracts and their arbitration agreements. Now, there's no doubt separability facilitates arbitration, but can you imagine running an arbitration without separability? And if the answer is yes, you have the answer as to why separability is not itself an implied term of arbitration as much as we'd like it to be. So that is my proposed framework. And with my remaining few minutes, I will just quickly touch on the second point, which is what extent do arbitration agreements and the CISG interact? And do I have enough time for this? May I continue on this? I'm looking now to the timekeepers. Yes, dear professor. Can I speak a little bit about the CISG yes, and yes. arbitration agreements? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So the, the reason I put these two topics together And so an arbitration agreement on its own is, of course, not a good. And when it's a negotiated term, it's neither sold nor purchased. So as a starting point, scholars who insist that the CISG does not apply to arbitration agreement seem to make a good point. But on closer scrutiny, the point is questionable. Beginning with the easy point. The CISG does not apply to submission agreements for the simple reason that as standalone contracts to submit current disputes to arbitration, that is not a sale of good. In other words, submission agreements to arbitrate are not covered by the CISG. But what about a clause inside a sale of goods contract? that requires the parties to submit future disputes to arbitration. Why should the CISG not apply to that clause, given that it sits inside a contract for the sale of goods? After all, Article 4 of the CISG is basically telling us that it does. Article 4 says the CISG does not concern validity matters to the extent that the CISG doesn't deal with them. <laughs> but it certainly deals with formation. In other words, it's saying, the CISG at Article 4 is saying the following. We're not going to tell you whether your arbitration agreement is valid or not. That's a different law. But we will tell you whether the parties made an offer for a sale of goods that included an arbitration clause. explain that the CISG does not govern validity. So what does that mean? It means that the CISG takes no position on any particular clause, including arbitration agreements. The CISG merely answers whether parties agree to that particular clause. In short, the CISG does apply to the formation of a contract of sale, including all its clauses, which also includes an arbitration agreement. And yet relying on that earlier heuristic, the dangerous view of separability that is perhaps two contracts would throw the CISG's position in flux because if an arbitration agreement is actually an independent contract, then there's no way the CISG applies to it because it is not a sale of good. And that's why it's so important to understand the proper separability rule. And you can even manipulate the rule. 
So what final thoughts should I give you? I can keep on going with this, but I should say that if you want more confirmation that the CISG at least contemplates arbitration agreement, you can And of course, it makes reference to the settlement of disputes, which would include arbitration agreements. Now, this doesn't mean that the CISG governs arbitration agreements per se, but it certainly sees, it certainly suggests that they can form part of the offer and acceptance, i.e. the formation. What's more, Article 81, Paragraph 1 of the CISG confirms that effectively the traditional separability rule appears to apply because what 81 tells us is when a contract is avoided, other clauses that necessarily must survive do survive. Now, most people talk about arbitration agreements, but this would also include exclusion of liability clauses. It would also include liquidated damage clauses. In other words, 81 says, listen, just because the CISG undoes a con undoes a contract doesn't mean that it takes a, a position that the contract never, ever existed. There are some clauses that must, by their very nature, survive. And arbitration would be one of them, to the extent that it is up to the arbitrators to determine whether the contract is indeed avoided. So far, then, separability, if only partially understood, can lead to arguments that are not always easy to sort through. Undoubtedly, separability is not easy, and I don't suggest that it is, and its consequences are difficult. But I hope that they are becoming less difficult for you. In closing, the 29th moot requires you to spin many, many plates teams that avoid the intellectual shortcut of making general statements about the law, in particular separability, will avoid getting into trouble as they should emerge with impressive arguments to convince the tribunal. But all of that means is if you take a thorough approach to the question, you will not fall into traps that arbitrators can set for you or other teams can set for you by questioning the internal logic of your argument. So with that, I will end here. I thank you and I, I thank, I wish my camera were working so you could see me smiling. Uh, it is simply not turning on. I don't know why. So thank you for your time and I'm happy afterwards to take any questions about this. Thank you, dear professor. Would you please uh, try your camera on when your mic is off? Yeah, I've tried that. It's still not. Is it possible that on your end, you can switch on my camera? Would you please keep the request? Uh, you know, sometimes the, the person in charge of the Zoom can switch on and off cameras. Is it possible yeah. you, now, you can do that? The host is giving the request. Oh, Make host the conversation room. Yes. You are now the host. I mean, you have the full authorities. Yeah, you yeah. should have the video on. Yeah, it's not. Okay. Thank you, dear professor, for your enlightening presentation and your invaluable remarks on the topic. Um, Quickly, now we go ahead for the second section of our discussion. Dear Dr. Sipple, would you please start your presentation with a quick and brief introduction on what the mooting hub is? I'll be happy to do so. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. And uh, before I do that, uh, oh, there he is. Welcome back. <laughs> Just in time. Um, thank you very much to Track uh, for having me. 
It's my great pleasure to be here tonight. Um, real quickly on the Mooting Hub, because I appreciate we are running behind uh, schedule. It, it's, it's a personal journey to me, really. Um, I wrote this book, uh, Mooting to Win, which you cannot really see well because I blurred my background um, a few years ago. And I did it back then because I realized that there are many teams out there which lack support, which uh, do not have a coach at all, or who, which, which uh, only have a coach who doesn't have that much experience, really. So I wrote this book um, with a friend back then. But I realized that it's not really helpful because when we think about teams that are really in a disadvantaged position, um, I'm speaking about ultimately teams that do not have a lot of financial means. They will not be in a position to buy a book. I mean, as, as crazy as it sounds, but it's this is the truth. So this is why some time ago I came up with uh, the idea of moving everything online, because especially since uh, the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot has already moved online. And we realized that by moving uh, material online, we can uh, really make everything available to everyone because almost anyone these days has an internet access, even if they are uh, growing up in, in, in very disadvantaged uh, financial means, let me put it this way, most people have um, an internet connection, although maybe there are bandwidth issues. Um, and this is why the material we put together on the Mooting Hub is mainly on uh, is mainly written text, although there are always videos. And uh, another thing that separates us from others, if I may put it this way, without you know giving the impression that I'm bragging, um, when you look at courses or introductions to moot court competitions, what you usually find is an intensive weekend uh, session at the outset. So. Over the course of a weekend, you're supposed to learn how to do research, how to write briefs, how to prepare the oral arguments, and then how to plead. Now, this is great as a start, but it's not really working because uh, the VS mode, as we always say, is a marathon and not a sprint. And you cannot learn in one entire weekend at the outset what you need to know over the course of six months. So what we do is, uh, we provide the lessons as we believe the students should need them. So um, next week, there's going to be a session, for instance, on how to uh, take, how to have most takeaways from pre moots because we're still one month away from the final rounds. And uh, this is something you need now, but you don't need to know it uh, three months ago. It's three months ago, it's, it's useless. I, I would say even one month ago, it's useless information because it's way too early. So this is um, our main, our, our three main concepts. The third one I haven't mentioned yet. So the first one is make it available to everyone. The second one is uh, provide it in a timely fashion. The third one is it's free of charge. So we may, going forward, consider some selected courses uh, to be payable courses. But for now, everything is free. And our main courses, we always want to keep them free of charge. So this is uh, a brief introduction to the Mooting Hub. Thank you for giving me the chance to introduce it. And uh, anyone who is interested can simply find it at uh, www.themootinghub.com. With that, if that's okay, I'll move over now to my presentation. <laughs> and uh, I think the host, which I understand is now you, Professor Damesis, needs to give me the, the right to share my screen, <laughs> else I cannot do that. And uh, oh, now I've been given hosting rights, fantastic. And uh, thank you, so it works. 
And uh, before I start, if you allow me on a, on a personal note, um, Professor Dimsis, I, I did publish a lot because as much as I am mainly a practitioner, I, I also publish a lot, but I'm, I'm very glad I never wrote about separability. Else, uh, I may have been one of those people you would refer to as an authority. <laughs> With that, um, let me uh, tell me tell you my uh, top ten mooting tips. And um, you heard before that um, there is a danger about having fancy quotes. And top ten, of course, is fancy. Um, you hear a lot from a lot of different people. And what I think are the top 10 tips is not necessarily what someone else thinks. But I basically base this on, on two main premises. Um, or I should say three, three to be precise. Um, the first one is that if you want to do well at um, the Vismut or, or any moot court competition, the basics need to be there. So no one, you know, if, if I have to start about uh, body language, if I have to start about eye contact, this is not going anywhere. So I presuppose that the basics are there. And, and my other two assumptions or submissions, I should rather say, are that uh, first, doing well means that um, you build rapport with the arbitral tribunal. That's the first uh, submission. And the second submission is that you need to know how to answer questions. Because ultimately, this is really where you will get points. You will not get points from simply pleading in a good way. Because this is really the, the minimum expectation. And if you want to go far, if you want to do really well, then you need to be able to build rapport with the tribunal. And you need to be able to answer questions. And this is mainly what those 10 tips are about. They're all about building rapport or answering questions. So I can skip this. So what does building rapport mean? Rapport, if you use the dictionary definition, is a close and harmonious relationship in which the people or groups concerned understand each other's feelings or ideas and communicate well. Now that's a big quote which doesn't mean much, but ultimately you need to understand each other's feelings or ideas and communicate well. This is really what building rapport in a moot court competition is. But how do you do that? That's really the question. And here are my, my five uh, top uh, ideas on how to do it. You must know who you are speaking to. And I deliberately put two um, quite contrasting pictures here, the picture of a young woman and a rather not so young man, because the people you are dealing with are gonna be very different from one another. I'm, I'm speaking of course of your judges, of the arbitrators. So ideally you should do a quick research before your matches. Are there any publications? Is there any publication on separability for instance? And is this person an authority or not? Because if this person may have a certain view on a specific topic, then you may want to adjust your pleadings, even if you are not 100% convinced. Or at least if you don't adjust your pleadings, adjust in the sense that you expect a certain backlash, certain way of questions. Also, when I say no, you are speaking to, there is this beautiful quote by Dale Carnegie. Remember that a person's name is to that person the sweetest and most important sound in any language. I'm a big, big believer in calling judges by their names. And I know that it can get very, very difficult because some judges have names that may not be so easy to pronounce. But my experience is that when you make an effort to pronounce a judge's name, even if you get the judge's name wrong, on average, the judge is going to like you more, if you want to put it this way, than when you simply call that person madam or sir, or, you know, Miss Arbitrator, Mr. Arbitrator. Oh, 
by now. Um, I had a list of 40 rules. I forgot all of them except for this one. And I believe it uh, applies so many times in life and it also applies in moot court competitions. Every judge is different. You have the academics, you have the lawyers or practitioners, you have diplomats sometimes, you have none of the above. It really depends. And you need to read your judges in the course of your match and adjust accordingly. You must adapt your pleadings. This sounds very difficult if I put it in the abstract, but in practice, what does it mean? Quite often you really And I think every second question I started with, uh, when we put what you say into practice, and I was then, you know, continuing. So you would know that with someone like me, theoretical arguments probably work less well, but I'm a big believer in practice and, and in practical points. For instance, a question that I've been asking several times this year is what is the market price in this problem? How do we determine it? Where do we find it? Because really as a practitioner that I mainly am myself, I would be trying to find an answer to that question because I believe it's of fundamental importance if I want to make the argument that there is a valid offer and I'll limit myself to that else I'm telling you too much now. Be polite. This is a really basic rule one should expect, but so many times I see people make mistakes here. And um, one very, very basic rule is I would never simply answer a question between a US law school and an Asian, like a, a university from Asia and from East Asia, I should say. And you know that East Asians generally have this reputation on being overly polite. And uh, on average, I would say people from North America or at least the US, I have to be careful what I'm saying here in the presence of Canadians, they have the reputation of maybe being more casual. And it's funny how both teams got it wrong. The uh, US school would always just say yes, or sometimes even yeah, which I would never do. Um, the Asians would always say yes, your excellency. Um, I'll get to that point in a minute. Um, it may be appropriate in some moot court competitions, not in the Vs moot, which is a commercial moot. My rule is this quote here, it's a wise thing to be polite. So being rude is stupid. You cannot establish rapport when you are not polite, when you don't show respect to the arbitral tribunal. At the same time, don't overdo it. This is what I mean by your excellency. Your excellency may be appropriate when uh, you plead in, in the Chesap, but not in a commercial mood where you have people like um, like myself, practitioners, you know, who who are uh, lawyers, who sit there um, in in real life, also as arbitrators. This leads me to my next tip, which is be Prince Charming or Cinderella. If you charm your judges by smiling, you will earn a lot of points. What many people forget is that smiling subconsciously makes the person opposite to you or in front of you respond. 
and reciprocate with what? With a smile. And when we smile, we feel better. So when you smile, on average, your arbitrator is going to smile back, your judge, and then that person feels better because when we smile, we feel better. This has nothing to do with the law. It's purely psychology, but it's tremendously powerful. You must make your judges feel understood. How do you do that? You can do it, for instance, um, when your judge is asking a question, you lean in and you nod. You don't overdo it, you know, by nodding like this, but, but you want to nod. You want to nod politely to give the, the judge the feeling that you understand where she or he is coming from. At the same time, don't be a bootlicker. And sorry for that expression. That's maybe quite casual here. I appreciate that. But I know who I'm speaking to. My audience is students. So I dare to use uh, this expression. What is a bootlicker? It's someone who is overdoing it, who is being much more than just being polite. So smiling is good, but you shouldn't make jokes and then laugh at your own jokes. You should not say, this is a great question. Um, I also am against saying, thank you for that question. Um, but above all, I'm against saying, this is a great question. Why do I say that? Put yourself in the judge's shoes. Now, you may be, as I put before, of various different types, but Keep in mind that as a judge, you're always somewhat above the moot court participant, the student, else you wouldn't be judging. And even if you have just um, participated in the Vs moot once with moderate success, that still gives you an advantage over a current participant because that participant is doing it for the first time. Because as we know, you can only participate once. Now, if you tell that person, that's a great question. You are doing two things. First, you are judging that person, which really you shouldn't do because it's the judge who is judging you and not the other way around. And second, you are putting yourself in a very difficult spot because going forward, if you do not say every single time, that's a great question, then you are telling the judge, which can be the same judge or a different judge. Oh, now you're not asking a good question. Also, again, think about it from the judge's perspective. Why on earth would I ask a bad question? If I'm asking you a question, of course, I think it's great. This is why I'm asking it to you. And I wouldn't be asking anything unless I thought it's at least a good question. So don't say that this is a good, this is a great question. Above all, don't say, oh, wonderful point. And trust me, I've seen this before. And it's ridiculous when you do it to, to someone who is uh, even three times your age. And I've also seen that. I've actually seen it with uh, the late Professor Hunter, who didn't know how to react back then. <laughs> uh, that made it even more comical. But uh, trust me, as much as it was comical, it didn't earn the team any points. I already emphasized this before the exaggerated body language. So nodding is okay, but don't you know overdo it. You you want to keep it all um, in a certain limit. You should listen gratefully when you receive feedback. Now I always tell students, moot court participants, that what I say is my opinion and that they are absolutely free to disagree. You're also absolutely free to disagree with anything I say. This is entirely your decision, but you should listen carefully and also gratefully. First of all, this is purely out of self-interest. Many judges give the feedback first and then they give you the points. If they give you the feedback and you are looking around and not looking at the screen anymore, your points may just drop. 
So it's quite stupid, you know, really to not at least pretend you're paying attention. And sometimes I, I admit that sometimes we have to pretend only and in reality, we don't listen. That's okay. It's your choice, but at least pretend and don't look away. Don't look um, elsewhere. Don't, don't show the judge that you're not interested because you may lose points. At the same time, again, don't overdo it. I've heard um, a moot court student once say in, in, in the same match to every single one of the judges, this is the best feedback I've ever received. This was so helpful. Like, how on earth does that make any sense if you say it three times in the same match? No one took this um, student seriously anymore. And in fact, I could see one judge as he was grading after the match, still shaking his head. And this was in utter disbelief at this, you know, exaggerated remark. This was the great feedback, greatest feedback I've ever received. This brings me to my second submission that answering questions truly matters. Again, this is where you can re really show your advocacy. You don't really show your advocacy when you do your regular pleadings, so to say, because as much as this is not easy, neither in a moot court competition nor in real life when, when we act as counsel, it is something that is expected. It's something that should be the minimum. Pleadings can be learned by heart. And this is really not hard with sufficient practice, but your answers, you know, the answers you give to the judges, once they ask you a question, they indicate how well you understood everything, how well you can find counter arguments to a judge playing devil's advocate, for instance, and also how well you handle pressure. I'm one of those judges who, at least when I see that a team is doing very well, I deliberately put students under a lot of pressure. And I don't do it to give you a hard time because you know I, I enjoy it, um, but I do it because I wanna see how, how good you really are. And I cannot see how good you really are unless I put you under a lot of pressure. So ultimately, how well you answer a question is really gonna missed the point and we saw this today even though it was the final of the vietnam uh cisg pre mode as it's called there uh there were three students which completely missed the points of a question and this was not because the judges asked the questions in a strange way this was entirely because the students didn't listen attentively but what does listen, listening attentively mean? Listen with your eyes also. If you get someone like myself, and I'm sorry I'm speaking so much about myself, but I do a lot, a lot of things um, somewhat differently from the average judge, but it's not that I'm the only one. I see a lot of judges uh, like me, especially practitioners who really enjoy doing this, like myself. I will often smile when I ask a question because I know it's a little bit of a silly question. For instance, when it comes to jurisdiction, I will sometimes deliberately say something like, and, and that's a silly question. Um, I will say, so counsel, you don't like this tribunal, right? You want us out from here. Of course, I don't mean that. And of course, when I sit as an arbitrator in real life, I would never ask that. But again, I wanna put you under pressure and I wanna see also how you can handle silly questions. In the past, I think this was uh, two or three years ago, there was uh, the, the Vismut was about chocolate cake. And the issue was whether it was um, 
I think sustainable chocolate or something like that. Um, anyway, it was it was healthy chocolate versus regular chocolate. And, and um, I would start a question with counsel, do you have any children? And most often the question was no. And then I would say, well, I have two children and my children don't get the cheap chocolate. And then I would remain silent. You know, this is really a silly question slash comment, which only serves the purpose of uh, testing you. But because I find it silly myself, I find it hard to remain fully serious when I do that. I'm, I'm not that much of a good actor. So when you see me smile, you already know that I'm not 100% serious. And your answer can obviously be adjusted accordingly. But if you do not listen attentively, if you only use your ears to listen, but not your eyes, then it's very hard. So it listening attentively really means doing much more than just using your ears. Look at the body language, look at facial expressions. Um, for instance, when a judge frowns like this before answering, before asking a question, Arguably, this is an important point, and arguably, the judge um, really doesn't agree with what you just said. So there are numerous ways to do it if you use your eyes also. You must keep your calm. This goes back to me saying, I put you on the spot, and I deliberately test how you act and react under stress. But remember that no one is going to kill you. This is just a, a match. Most judges really just want to have fun and want to enjoy this. Even if you screw up completely like an answer, what is going to happen? In the very, very worst case, this is the reason you get knocked out. But you don't even know why you get knocked out because no judge is going to tell you, and you got this answer wrong, so you cannot proceed. You know, no one is going to do that. So even then, you don't know. So really keep in mind that this is just a competition, a fun competition. And I'm not telling you do not take it seriously, but keep that in mind. Remain calm. Don't get flustered when there are traps, because you have quite a few arbitrators who deliberately make traps for you. I have in one competition, for instance, ask this question. Do you know about the efficiency of advanced coal plants? And this only had to remotely do with the Wiesmuth problem. And not knowing the question had, sorry, not knowing the answer to that question had no impact whatsoever. But if you get all flustered and you start looking at your material, and I can see that you are not the um, successful lawyer, the confident lawyer that you're trying to represent there, then arguably you are not as good as someone who remains calm and simply says, I apologize, I cannot assist you with that question. When you answer, you must be specific and you really must answer the question. When it comes to complaints from arbitrators, when we have our deliberations, I think the number one complaint, you know, complaint, the, the number one thing we criticize is that participants sometimes do not answer the question. They beat around the bush. They say something that's not really an answer. And this is really not what we're looking for. At the same time, do not show off your knowledge every single time. You must be concise and precise when you answer. And it's not necessary to cite five different cases for one question. What this does is simply it's going to make you lose time. So it's actually not good when you show off how much you know every single time. It may be appropriate from time to time but don't overdo it, as I've said before. At the same time, keep in mind that the longer your answer gets, the more dangerous territory you walk into. The more you say, the more you can 
the more mistakes you can make. And I saw this today once again at this uh, Vietnam pre mode final, where one of the participants had the tendency to give really elaborate answers. This was not to show off, it was just her way of doing it. But uh, halfway through her answer, I already had two follow up questions because she said so many things that triggered additional questions. You must stand your ground. People like me are trying to deliberately say something that makes you concede so that you give in. As a lawyer, keep in mind why you are there. You are there to ultimately fight for your client. And keep in mind that very often your client's life, the legal life, not, not the physical life, but the, the life of uh, the client, you know, the, the entity may depend on this one arbitration. If you lose it and you get ordered to pay a few million dollars, that may be the end because you have to go into bankruptcy. So imagine that you are the CEO of that company and you attend the arbitration hearing. And there is a question by the arbitral tribunal that challenges your position and your lawyer gives in immediately. You would not be happy. This is not to say that you should never give in, but usually you must defend your position because you're fighting for your client. At the same time, you must defend your arguments reasonably. And we know that every case has its weaknesses when it comes to the Vismut. There is not one single issue in the Vismut really not good because when you get when your argument gets attacked and you immediately say yes you're right then you're losing out reasonably defending in my opinion also means um, you are a shield rather than a sword by that i mean that when you respond you don't attack the question by the arbitrator but rather you use the shield to sort of deviate the attack and you make it slide off from you. This is really how you should do it. My last point. Last point. You sorry. sorry. Dear Harald. Yes. Would you please conclude in a, in a minute? Yes, I can do that. I, I'm at my last. I'm at my last slide. Um, my last point is: you must find back to your pleadings quickly. Time truly matters. Remember, you only have 15 minutes, and it's very helpful if you find connecting phrases. And this brings me to the next point. What truly matters here is also, and then you continue with the next topic. We must always keep in mind that. Never say, can I move on? I saw this many times today because in East Asia, this is what teams almost always do. I'm exaggerating here, I know. But uh, the moment you say, can I move on? You trigger an additional question or you trigger an, no, you cannot. And then you're stuck. So move on quickly. With that, thank you very much for your attention. And good luck uh, to everyone with this pre -mood and of course, Vienna and Hong Kong. Thank you, dear Dr. Sipel. Your tips were very informative and uh, useful. I know that uh, the Moody's have gained a lot. And not only in the mood, I believe a number of these tips were also in applicable life, in yeah. the real practitioner. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, dear doctor, just a humble uh, question. Would you please give us back the host role? <laughs> yeah, please. 
It seems it apparently seems that we can have only three hosts. Now we are the guests. Track is the guest, okay? <laughs> Uh, what what do I get in return? And make us host. <laughs> um, but sorry, can you explain how I can make you the host? Because I, I do not know. He doesn't want to give it back to us. <laughs> Serious. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> no, I, I honestly don't know. How, how do I do that? I believe you should have right click on that, I believe. Huh? Uh, I didn't, on should, the name of track. On the name of or track. Maybe, click on or more. maybe Professor can do that. So yes. I, I've given it to uh, Dr. Sippel, but yes, there you go. No, I, I just yes. gave it Perfect. to you. So. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, now uh, let's take a look at the Q&A section to see what the questions are. How many minutes we have? Uh, I think we can conclude in two or three minutes. That would be good, yeah. Thank you. Uh, dear Professor Anthony Dempsey's, uh, Philippe Ray, the Air Free Play Ray, has uh, two questions posed to you. Uh, may I read the question or no? You yourself. I can read it, sure. The first one is what role, if any, does. That is a great question, but it is nevertheless an interesting one. So I suppose the first place I'd begin is to, I'm sure everyone knows that the Hague principles expressly exclude choice of law to arbitration agreements. And so you might say, maybe it has no place at all. I think that maybe raises a question of, are the Hague principles agnostic or are they simply saying, uh, the rules that we were setting down do not apply pari passu to arbitration agreements. Um, I would say that probably understanding which separability rule you're using could help to inform that. In other words, if you're using a rule that says these are not independent contracts, then it is simply a clause inside of a contract, which if it falls, if it's deemed a, an international commercial contract, perhaps the rule is there and you just apply that rule. On the other hand, if you treat separability as an independent contract, then the wording of the Hague principle seems to uh, give us an answer. But I, I would have to think more on that. The second part is what articles best addresses separability of arbitration agreements? Oh, that's a loaded question. I, I tell you the one I wrote, but that seems a little too self-serving. Um, but uh, I, frankly, I like to go to the travaux. I go to the travaux of the model law, for example, and I see what it had to say. And I, see, I look to commentaries on effectively the travaux. What I avoid doing is going to people who are commenting on the commentary, because far too often I've noticed that they're not holding true to what the commentary has actually said. So to me, primary source, go right to the source information, read the debate, see what it is that they were thinking of. Um, the second question I think might also be for me, what if any is a relation between the separability of the arbitration agreement and public policy rules on the enforcement of foreign arbitral awards? Well, again, we need to unpack this a little bit. The, the public policy rules, and I believe this question is speaking to New York Convention Article 5.2b, uh, we must uh, determine what do you mean by public policy? There are some views that there's some broad public policy. I think those views are mistaken. The, uh, what I believe the New York Convention is saying is it is a public policy of the enforcement state. So the question to ask yourself then is, is the enforcement state, does it take the view that if you mix up separability, that this is an affront to the fabric of its law? I would find it surprising if any jurisdiction took that view, because public policy is a very high threshold and should be distinguished between how the rules of law apply in that jurisdiction. Um, so to answer your question directly, I would think that it has very little relation at the enforcement stage. Dr. 
Ms. Bell, I think the next question is for you. Indeed it is, thank you. If, uh, so the question is, which of your tips most effectively engenders the trust of the arbitral tribunal by oralists? Now, truly it's a mixture of everything um, because you cannot say you do this one thing and everything is gonna work out. Um, I wish life were that simple, but I'm afraid it's not. However, if I had to pick one single and, and, and you know, only one tip, then I would say smile. And, and this is because psychologically smiling is, is so efficient. Um, I can prove this, as some of you would say in your pleadings, I can prove this by, by reference to real life. Now, I think everyone here has already seen a baby. And when you smile at a baby, what does a baby do? It smiles back. But the baby is not yet capable of understanding why it should smile. It is not capable of understanding that, you know, it, it's not being taught when you smile, you must smile back. It's just a natural reaction because this is what humans do. And it has been shown scientifically that throughout cultures worldwide, when you smile at a baby, they smile back. So again, if I, if I had to, to pick this one single thing for this reason, then I would say smile. Okay, thank you. Thank you, dear professor. Thank you, Dr. Sipo. Uh, this is the end of the webinar. And uh, dear speakers, if you if there is any other point to add, we are ready to hear. No points. Well, if if, if I may add something, um, I wrote the book "Mooting to Win," and that's that's the name of the title. But what I always tell um, students is see the Vismut competition as a journey to personal excellence. If you participate and if you work hard, then you will improve. And this, in my opinion, really makes you a winner. The winning team is not the team that ultimately wins the prize, even if it's a, a cash prize, as we pointed out, as was pointed out by Oasis, which is very popular, apparently. Of course, then formally, you are the winner. But when you look at life in a, in a broader sense, and when you have um, as much white hair as I already do, unfortunately, then you will realize that in life, it's not about formally being the winner. It's much more about your personal journey to, to excellence, to improving, to being better, and really see this as an opportunity to grow and uh, move up and and be able to to reach your goals and all the best for your pleadings uh starting next week but also in vienna and hong kong and uh finally thank you very much once again to the organizers for having me it was a great pleasure thank you i'll just thank add you, very you. briefly um, my talk might have made people think that there are right and wrong answers but we know the practice of law is about two different sides looking at what should be the same set of facts differently, which means if you have authority for the position you're advocating, rely on those authorities and don't worry if maybe the other side has an answer that they're saying you are wrong about. That's the job of a lawyer. You argue based on the authorities you have and the facts that are in front of you. And if you do that, don't worry at the vismut anyway, whether people disagree with your authorities. At most, that's all they're doing. They're disagreeing with your authorities. Thank you, thank you both. I fully echo the last words of Professor Damesies and Dr. Sipo. Uh, go for the experiences rather than for the scores. And also remember always there is no one correct answer. As long as you're arguing correctly, you are the winner. Thank you. Okay, great. I'm so delighted to announce that uh, by tomorrow, Monday, March 7th, 
Um, our wish pre-mood general rounds are going to start, get started. I wish the best of luck for all the participants. And thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And nothing to add. Goodbye.